from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And it is an unexpected honor to be able to introduce to you all today Matt De La Pena. The novels of Matt De La Pena have garnered numerous awards for their realistic, unvarnished depiction of young adults. His novels include Mexican White Boy and I Will Save You. He wrote the picture book A Nation's Hope, the story of boxing legend Joe Lewis, which was illustrated by Kadir Nelson. Matt has also written for Guys Read, a series edited by John Cheska. His new novel is The Living, which focuses on the aftermath of a massive earthquake in California. So please um, join me in welcoming Matt to the stage. Thank you. So I'm going to start today by telling you guys a quick story. Um, I grew up on the border of San Diego and Mexico. And we lived there for a good portion of my early life. But just before junior high, we moved uh, north to a town called Cardiff by the Sea, which was a much nicer area. And we left behind my entire family this family that you know I love, the Mexican side of my family. So when we first got there, you know, I was alone up in this new town. It was the summer, I didn't know anybody. And my uncle, my favorite uncle in the world, his name was Uncle Tim. He was my favorite uncle because he had neck tattoos and he had a new girlfriend every holiday and I was like, wow, that's an option. So I liked him <laughs> and so I loved this this uncle, but my mom was a little weary of him because he was often in trouble with the law and stuff. So he came up from my old neighborhood, drove his Bronco. Do you guys know what a Bronco is? A lot of kids don't know the, about the Bronco. He drove his Bronco up to my new neighborhood and he came into my house and he said to my mom, look, Ronnie, that's her name. I'm gonna take Matt to the beach. He doesn't know anybody here. I'm doing this for him. And my mom was like, I'm not so sure about this Uncle Tim, like, where are you gonna be going? And she was very nervous about this. But eventually, she conceded. She let my uncle take me to the beach. My uncle turned to me and he said, Matt, I got a, uh, I got a cooler of Cokes. I got a football. All you need is a towel and we'll go to the beach. So I grab a towel, get into the Bronco, we drive down to the beach. He parks in the parking lot. He goes, Matt, today is your day. We could sit anywhere on the beach you want. And so I was looking around and I was like, hey, maybe by the lifeguard tower would be a good idea. I was like, how about this, Uncle Tim? And he was like, you know what, that's okay, but let's go sit over there, right next to three girls in bikinis. And it was very awkward because the beach was pretty open and we literally laid our towels right next to them. <laughs> and you could tell the girls were like, what's up with these guys, you know? But my uncle, slowly but surely it dawned on me that he was using me as a prop to get women. As an older person, I respect this, but as a younger person, I didn't really understand what was happening. So he started throwing the football around with me and I would catch it and he would run up and tackle me and push my head in the sand, but I didn't care. I was with my favorite uncle. He ripped off his shirt. He was like flexing. The girls were slowly but surely starting to notice. And then my uncle got a little bit tired of throwing the football around and he decided that he wanted to step up our game. So he goes, Matt, let's go swim to the pier out there. And I was like, okay. So he runs and he's swimming. <clears throat> I jump in afterwards and I'm swimming. And about five minutes into the swim, I was like, wow, I forgot. Like, I can't really swim, you know? And this is, this, maybe this isn't a good idea. And I was like, Uncle Tim, I don't think I can make it. And he turned around and he goes, Matt, don't be a baby. And I didn't want to be a baby in front of my favorite uncle. So I kept going. 10 minutes later, my uncle stopped and he was treading water and he goes, shit, Matt, I don't know if I'm gonna make it either. And so I was like, what are we gonna do? And I started to hyperventilate. Have you guys ever hyperventilated? I was hyperventilating, worrying that I was gonna drown. I was putting my hand on my uncle's shoulder to try to survive. He was brushing it away because all he cared about was himself. And I was like, what are we gonna do? And he's like, we gotta call for the lifeguard. This is a true story, by the way, that is now in my third book, We Were Here. I stole it from real life. He starts whistling for the lifeguard. I'm treading water barely getting breaths here and there. And I'm noticing that the girls that were on the towels, they're standing up now watching us. People that are walking their dogs are stopping and they're like, wow, look at those guys in distress. So everybody was kind of 
checking us out. And the lifeguard saw us, and she picked up the binoculars and zeroed us in, and then she put them down, and this is a true story. She picked up an electric megaphone, and she goes, no, just stand up. And this, honestly, we were on a sandbar. And for me, as a young guy, I was like pretty young, the, the, the water, the surface was still a little over my head, but I figured out that if I went to the bottom and jumped, I could get a breath and then go back down. But my uncle, he walked back to shore. And we got to the beach, and the girls were like giggling and stuff. And, and you know, I'm a young man, and I'm like, screw it, I'm alive. I was like, Uncle Tim, you want to keep throwing the football around? And he's like, no, we got to go right now. So he packs up the stuff. We leave. He won't even look at anybody on the beach. He sits in the Bronco. I, I get into the, the other side. And this is where the story turns a little. Because as my uncle was pulling out of the, dr of the uh, parking lot, a younger guy, a uh, Caucasian male, was driving up and honked his horn real loud at my uncle. Now, see, you got to understand, my uncle's a working class guy, and he had just experienced shame. And working class people often don't know what to do with their shame. So my uncle flipped this guy off. The guy made the mistake of flipping him off back. My uncle jumped out of the car. He's a construction worker. He grabbed his sledgehammer. He didn't touch the guy, but he smashed every single window in the guy's car. Police ended up coming, picking him up, taking him away. And here I was on the beach watching this. And just so you guys know, this is how a lot of young men in working class families learn what it means to be a man. And this is the kind of thing that fascinates me as a writer. So everything I do now as a writer, I try to go to that space where these kids are learning, especially boys, are learning what does it mean to be a man and how do they break free, free from the machismo mentality. So I'm gonna back up a little bit and tell you guys how I became an author. It's kind of an unlikely story because I wasn't a great student as a, as a kid, um, very mediocre. And then I had a real big setback when I was in second grade when they wanted to hold me back a year because I couldn't read. Now I gotta tell you, this was a, a major ego blow to me. I was like, if I can't make it to third grade, I must be a kind of a dumb kid. And for many, many years, I carried that definition of myself with me. So I thought I was just kind of a not intelligent kid. And so like anybody else who's not good at one thing, I tried to find other things I was good at. And for me, it was sports. Sports was a huge haven, um, especially the game of basketball. So if I didn't feel comfortable playing or in school, I felt an incredible home in on a court of basketball. So. This was my, my space, my haven. For many years, I just thought I was gonna do what everybody else in my family did, which was graduate high school, get married, get a job. There was no thought to college because nobody I knew had gone to college except for my teachers. But when I was in junior high, I started hearing more and more about this thing called college. And I remember there was one woman I found out, a friend of my mother's, she had been to college for two years and I remember I went up to her and I said, Miss, could you explain to me what is college? I don't get it. And she said, well, Matt, if you go to college, you can pick any class you want. And I thought, wow, if I ever went to college, I would study psychology. I kinda, it's interesting the way people think. And she goes, and Matt, if you go to college, you can meet people from, and even all over the world. And she very much knew how I was and she looked me straight in the eye and she said, and Matt, if you go to college, you can meet all these new girls. And I was like, miss, I'm going to college. <laughs> so I decided that day that I was going to go to college to meet women. It's a pretty good plan, right? Actually, it is. Um, but the thing is, as I left my friend's house, I had to decide, how am I going to get to school? And it dawned on me that I knew my parents couldn't afford college. I knew my grades weren't good enough to get an academic scholarship. I was, like I said, a very average student. So I thought, wow, maybe I could get a basketball scholarship. Maybe that could be my ticket to a, an education. So I'll kind of just skim past the rest and just tell you that for the first time in my life, I had a tangible goal and it changed my life. And I wanted to go to college and I wanted to get, get there on a basketball scholarship. So I worked really hard. 
My mom had one rule for me. She said, if you get a 3.0 in high school, I will never bother you about playing too much basketball or not being home. So I got a 3.0. If I ever started to flirt with a 3.1, I would like miss a test on purpose because I, I wasn't trying to get extra credit. I just wanted a 3.0. <laughs> so I did, that's what I got in high school. And when I got to college, I had one of those epiphany moments. Um, I always thought maybe I would play basketball overseas or something. But the truth is, I learned quickly that I wasn't good enough at basketball to play professionally. And I learned really early on, it, the game involved Steve Nash. I was guarding him and it didn't go so well for me. And after the game, I actually decided or I, I probably was gonna have to do a different job. And so I thought, well, what do I like to do besides playing basketball? And there were two things I liked to do. The first one was playing guitar, but I was way too shy with a guitar. I could never play in front of people. The third one is I loved writing spoken word poetry in the back of class when I should have been paying attention. And so all these spoken word poems, I didn't know that they were gonna be anything other than just goofing off or writing a poem about a girl, something silly. There was never a whole lot of meaning. There was just a lot of uh, emphasis on the music of language. So that became kind of my, my new plan when I got to college, I was like, Maybe I could become a poet. I only ended up selling one poem in my life. I made $10, so that didn't work out. But <laughs> when I read this, this one novel, changed my life, and it was, it was called The Color Purple. And I'll never forget reading this novel. And for the first time in my life, I was, I was so engrossed in this character and the story. Usually a book would just I gotta tell you, some of the kids here might identify with this. I'd read 20 pages and I couldn't get into it and I'd just be like, ah, this book's not for me. But for some reason, this book locked me in and I'll never forget turning the last page of the book and I found myself on the verge of tears. And I gotta tell you, growing up in a machismo family, tears are against the rules for a guy, right? I will put it to you like this, if I was like let's say I was junior high and I was walking with my dad down the street and I got hit by a truck. And let's just say like a kneecap was over on this side of the street and I had an ankle in a bush over here. You know what my dad would do? He'd find wherever my head was and say, all I'm saying, Matt, is you better not cry, even if I was on the verge of death. <laughs> so the fact that I was gonna cry reading a book was shocking to me. I do want the guys in here to know that I did not cry after reading the book. I, it, was, it was a close call. I felt it coming on, but what I did is I just looked up and it just soaked back in and it was all good. <laughs> so don't tweet that because my uncles are listening. Um, but anyways, this was a big moment for me because I, I suddenly found a secret place to feel. And as a working class kid, I think that's how you, you kind of like go against the way I saw my uncle de deal with shame. Books taught me that I could have a, an outlet that I didn't know about and nobody else needed to know about it. So it became a secret place for me to feel things. And so I ended up becoming a writer and I wanna take you uh, through a couple of my books. My agenda quickly was, if you're ever gonna read one of my novels, I'm gonna give you something to feel and it's gonna have meaning. I, I decided that I wanted to tell you guys uh, like a little story from each book to kind of introduce them. The first one is very quick. My first book is called Ball Don't Lie, and it's about a kid who's a great basketball player. Does this surprise you? Came from nowhere. Um, actually, I made myself a rule when I got out of, out of grad school. I said I will never, ever write about basketball because I didn't want basketball to define me, and I made it two weeks before I started my first book, Ball Don't Lie. Um, it's about an obsessive, compulsive kid who's in the foster care system. He's an excellent basketball player, but he just doesn't have anything else going for him. Um, and the whole OCD thing really fascinates me. I think all of, all of us wanna have control of the world in some way. And my idea was that here's a kid, Sticky, who's, his name's Sticky. He's in the foster care system. He gets picked up by different families throughout the book and given back. And I thought, wow, he has no control over the big things in life. So I thought, well, maybe he tries to control the little things. And so that's how the OCD thing was born but also it factors into why he's good at basketball. 
because he can't leave a court until he hits a certain number of shots, etc. So that's the first one. My second book is called Mexican White Boy. It's about growing up mixed race. More and more people are mixed today, right, in America. This book came out in 2008. I really just wanted to write about my experience of being mixed. My dad's Mexican, my mom is white. And I just wanted to really talk about the idea of how when you're a mixed race kid, you sometimes switch codes within your own family structure. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. And I believe our president is a mixed race person too, so he should probably read this. If you guys see him, <laughs> send an email to the Congress. Um, I wanted to tell you one quick story. Uh, these are the kind of things that really excite me about characters. I'm into uh, the music of, of broken English. I think that's very interesting. One day I was on the subway. I was going from Brooklyn to Manhattan, where I live now, going to teach a class. And those of you who have been on the subway or the metro, you know you've got to create space for yourself because everybody's pushed together often. So what, what I always do is what a lot of people do. I read a book, and I wear headphones and listen to music. So this one day I was doing just that. And I was uh, minding my own business, and onto the train came this Puerto Rican man who worked for the subway system. He had an MTA uniform on, and his son, who kind of looked a little rough, he had a shaved head, he just looked a little tough, um, probably around junior high age. And I could tell that the, the dad was really, really angry at the son, and so I wanted to figure out why. So like any good stalker, what I did is I <laughs> turned the music down, but I left the headphones on, so it seemed like I was still listening to the music. And I overheard the dad lecturing his son, but the thing is he was using crazy cliches that didn't make sense. You know, like he was leaning on every cliche he'd ever heard. What I realized is that the kid had been caught with marijuana at school and he'd been suspended. Therefore, the dad was very angry, but he just didn't have the language to really tell the kid what, what he wanted to say. So he was saying things like this. He's like, son, you don't understand. You can't do what you just did. Don't you get it? Man is his own best doctor. He's like, you fake it till you make it, son. He goes, a leopard can never change his spots. And I was sitting there thinking, I was like, what does this have to do with weed? You know, this is weird. <laughs> but what I did is I turned to the last page of the book I was reading, and it was a blank page like they often are, and I wrote every word he said, every cliche. And then he launched into a story that I will never forget. He goes, son, I see you watching me. You're listening to my words, but you aren't hearing what I'm saying. Another cliche. He goes, I'm going to tell it to you in a story. He goes, son, imagine if every single night I came home from, you came home from school, and I cooked you spaghetti for dinner. What is that, son? And I was like, whoa, this is like a trick question. What is the spaghetti? <laughs> and, the, and the guy was like, the son, if you, by the way, if you have a, a dad like this, you know there are no correct answers. The only thing you can do is either nod or shrug. This kid knew this, so he goes, I don't know. And he goes, I'll tell you what that is, son. That's the same old dinner every single night. And I was like, that's true. <laughs> and then he goes, but son, imagine if one night you came home from school and I had put some meatballs in there. What is that, son? And I was like, I can't wait to, I was like, with my pen, I was like, oh, I can't wait for this. And he goes, I'll tell you what that is, son. That's a change. That change is in you, son. That change is Jesus Christ. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this guy just went from meatballs to Jesus in two seconds. Nobody I've ever heard has done that. He then got off the subway, and I had all these things written down. And I was like, I got to put this dude in a book for sure. Because I was so, I'm so interested in people who, especially working class people, who sometimes lean on cliches to sort of make their point. They think it's wise. So I said, I'm going to make him a character. And at first, he, he was a character that was kind of comic relief for me. He became a character named Senior in here. But eventually, he became an important character because I said, maybe it doesn't matter exactly what you say to your son as long as you're there talking to him. So he, be, he actually delivers one of the most important lines in the novel. And he becomes, to me, one of the, the, the centerpieces of the, of the book. So that's Mexican White Boy. How am I doing on time? Good? I'm going to tell you guys one more story. 
from a book called We Were Here, and then I'm going to introduce my rec most recent book. We Were Here was a, it was a tough book for me because I knew so many parts of this book, but I didn't understand the character. And if you don't know the character you're writing, you don't have a book. I knew I wanted to sort of base it on Of Mice and Men, which is a, a big influence on me when I was in college. And I love how Steinbeck writes about California. I do the same. So I knew that. I also knew I was going to work with the group home system because I used, I used to work in a group home, and I was fascinated with the kids I met and their backstories that I would read in their files. But I didn't know the character. And, and I, I tried for about five months to write this book, and I just couldn't get it. I was about to give up on the book. When I did a school visit in Queens, New York, and I'll never forget, I was, I was doing this talk to about 50 kids who are sitting in a semicircle of chairs, but there weren't enough chairs for the number of students, so there are like 20 people standing in back. And I know how hard it is for kids, especially high school kids, to listen for 45 minutes, especially when you're standing, so I decided to do the talk quicker. So I'm doing the talk, and often when I'm doing a talk, I'm kind of bored with what I'm saying, like right now, and I'm secretly watching the crowd to see what I could steal like how people are dressed, who's flirting with who, who's going to get married and then divorced, st stuff like that. So I was doing this at the high school, and I saw this one younger girl. She raised her hand, and I could tell she was asking to use the restroom. She was sitting in a chair on the side, and I was like, okay, she's going to go use the restroom. I'll hold off on this one story that I wanted to tell until she gets back. And so I was doing that. I was talking about something else. And then this other older girl came and swiped her seat, who was sitting, standing up. And I was like, that's messed up. I don't like this girl. She has an attitude problem. <laughs> and then I started having this weird like, dream of the girl coming back from the bathroom and getting so mad she'd go up and smack the girl in the ear. And I was like, then I'll be this heroic author who has to break up the fight. And somebody will write an article, and it'll be in the New York Times, and I'll send it to my mom, and she'll be proud. So I was <laughs> thinking of these things. And uh, finally, the girl did come back. She did not want to fight. She saw that the girl had taken her seat, and she stood in the back instead. And I got to tell you, the, the most amazing thing happened, because I was bummed, and I was like, this poor girl, she got her seat taken. This Mexican boy who was standing in the front, he saw the whole thing too, and he motioned for the girl to come take his seat. And I'll never forget, the girl came and sat in his seat, and he went and stood in the back. And you know, he was the kind of kid who you never thought would give up his seat for a girl like that. I stopped the entire talk. And I said, hey, man, what you just did is one of the coolest things I've ever seen on a school visit. I started asking him questions. You could tell he was very uncomfortable with this. <laughs> but I continued to do it even longer because I like making people uncomfortable. So I kept doing it. And then at the very end, I said, hey, man, I'm going to sign all my books for you. But can you just tell me, what is your name? And he said his name was Miguel. I went home, made the character, and we were here. I changed his name from Derek to Miguel. And it changed the book. And I'll tell you briefly why before I, I take questions. I now knew two things about this character. I knew that the crime he'd committed to get put in into a, a group home, but I also knew he was the kind of guy who would give up his girl or a seat to a girl. You put those together and you have a real human being. And now that taught me a huge lesson. So I always look for that in my characters. What is the best part of them? And what is this, the, the ugly part of them? Put it together and you have a book. Um, Real quickly, I'm going to just introduce a book that comes out in November. It's called The Living. I'm super excited about it because most of my books are fairly quiet, and they have these, these blue-collar characters that I'm talking about. But I said, what if I took this working-class character and put it into a bigger novel so it's a survival novel with the same characters I always write? And I'm so excited for it to get into the world. The main character's name is Shy Espinoza. So I'm gonna, I have about five minutes left. Can I take questions from anybody? Anybody have a question for me? I think there are microphones here if you'd like to use them. As she's approaching the mic, does anybody have a guess? What do you think I named the chapter in Mexican White Boy that was sort of where the, the character that I stole off the subway enters the book? What do you think I named that chapter? If you get this, you will win a prize. Spaghetti and meatballs, I heard it back there. Yes. All right, so some of your characters have mental health 
health issues. Yes. Uh, what do you think the importance of writing about characters with mental health issues in young adult literature is, particularly today with the stigma behind mental illness? Well, I think uh, my job as a writer is to de never diagnose the characters. It's merely to list the symptoms. So I do deal with characters who, are, who have mental illness, but it's, I'm ignorant to that. I just am showing you the way they act and what they do. For me, it's the reader's job to actually put a label on it. I guess uh, the, the book that does that the most is I Will Save You, and this is a character who's severely, severely depressed and doesn't quite understand his depression. And my, I guess my goal with the book was to, to sort of exaggerate the fact that, like earlier I said, we all have good parts of us and bad parts of us. And uh, Carl Jung calls it the shadow. And I love this idea that we have the shadow that's part of us that we don't want the world to see. And I wanted, in a book, you have an opportunity to show it. So I, I just adore those kind of characters. I love following them. But ultimately, it's for the reader to figure out what their situation is. That was a hard question. She said she was going to ask me a hard one. It was tough. That's a very good question. So I think you guys all heard it. He was on the mic. Um, you know, I wrote a picture book called uh, A Nation's Hope with Joe Lewis. So this was the first experience I ever had with somebody completely different than me, although I am tough like Joe Lewis. Um, so that was a similarity. But um, I'm, I'm ri I've written a, a middle grade book, part of the Infinity Ring series, which was uh, with Scholastic, which was a character totally different from me. I think it would be, for me, very difficult to find the heartbeat of the character. I guess it'd be more work for me, but I guess eventually I will get there with a teen book. Thank you. Uh, incidentally, I just reported Mexican white boy for reading impaired people. Did you really? Thank you know you. what? I think you might be my favorite person here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just write about drugs and alcohol. <laughs> um, I'm just joking. Uh, I think, think write about things that y interest you. You know what the coolest thing about writing is for me? Is when I was your age, I would see little things in the world that I thought other people didn't think were a big deal. Like the way somebody treated somebody or the way that this guy gave up his seat for a girl. I think those are big things, but it seems like sometimes the world doesn't notice them. And as a writer, you get to make people notice them when they read your stories. So keep your eyes open. I always say this. I don't even know if I'm writing novels. I'm more just stealing from the world. You know, I kind of, uh, what's the word where you steal somebody's writing? Plagiarize. I plagiarize the world. So I, I would just keep your eyes open. The things you notice, those are the things you, you should write about. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, yes. Uh, where did you go to college? I went to the University of Pacific, which is in Northern California, um, in Stockton, California, maybe the worst town ever. Uh, it really is. And it's, in terms of the basketball, it, maybe you're asking that, it was in the Big West Conference back then, with like UNLV and stuff like that. Good question. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for listening to me. Appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.